Please welcome on stage, Katia Huta. Crowdsourcing, everybody knows about it, and back in 2006, when um, Jeff Howe framed the term, there were only a couple of organizations thinking about to collaborate with outsiders to get external insights, to get the creative um, views, for, not just from your internal R&D department, but from the outside world. But nowadays, more and more organizations trying to think about, to collect the ideas, the knowledge, the expertise from different areas, from different fields of expertise. And this was also the case when a process engineer started a pilot project, knowing from research that combining different fields of expertise, different areas of knowledge, maybe there's also something in it for him and listen to save his own life. Um, in 1992, he was um, um, going through a genetic um, 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 survey and they found out that he had morphine syndrome, which meaning that he had to go through a surgery where they open your chest, put you on an artificial heart and lung machine, stop your heart, take out your aorta, put in an artificial one. And the bad thing about it is to be on drugs and medicine for the rest of the life, and believe me, with some severe side effects. So he thought, I'm an engineer, I'm an R&D guy. So for example, if you think about if you have to repair um, some pipes, you wouldn't cut it and put in a new stuff, you would simply wrap it. And maybe because this aorta is also stretching, why should we take it out and put an artificial one inside? Maybe we can just simply wrap it. So we took some knowledge from different fields, aeronautic, gardening, also from the medicine and science, and he came up with a really simple and nice solution as he framed it. And here you can Water see the and he saved his, his life. Not only his life, his because he participated in the patient innovation community, his sharing his life. insights, sharing his, his knowledge and success stories with other patients. And after nine years, insights, sharing his knowledge and success stories with other patients. And after nine years after his surgery, he also helped more than 40 other patients with his innovation. Another interesting and also severe story were facing NASA. Houston, we have a problem. Jeff Davis, the director of the Space Life and Science Lab at NASA, he had severe budget cuts. 45% of his R&D budget was cut, meaning about 15 employees were just simply eliminated but still the pressure to be innovative and to solve the complex NASA challenges, the complex NASA problems. So he was sitting at the Harvard Business School in a classroom and heard about crowdsourcing. So he thought maybe that's a new way how we can you, um, use this and apply this. And then they set up the NASA tournament lab where they were trying to use the crowdsourcing principles to solve the NASA challenges. And what they were exactly doing, I would like to show you in a short video. Energy, in one form or another, powers everything on Earth, and the man-made things floating above it, too. This is the International Space Station. You've probably heard of it. It's powered by the sun, and the sun's energy is captured by the station's solar panel. Ensuring the space station harvests the most energy possible is a complicated task. 
right? Well, for one reason, see those large solar panels? Holding them to the station are very long, thin arms called longa. Any time an odd number of larger arms are in full sunlight, with others in the shadows cast by the rest of the space station, they bend and eventually break. For this reason, ISS operators are careful to position the station to limit shadow, and so only an even number of longer runs are shadowed at one time. However, this conservative positioning reduces the power the station can collect from the sun, thus causing inefficiency. NASA wants more power for the ISS. More power means more science and cool stuff that NASA can do on orbit. NASA needs a sophisticated algorithm, and they think you just might be the key to this whole equation. Introducing the NASA Tournament Labs International Space Station Roger on Challenge. Your solution just may help power the International Space Station and allow more science from more scientists around the world. Consider this your invitation to blast off with NASA. For more information, visit topcoder.com slash ISS, if you've got the right stuff. So being confronted with the severe budget cuts in R&D um, expenditures, Jeff Levy thought about new principles, new um, ways to be innovative, and he collaborated with Top Coder. Top Coder was founded back in 2001 as a community for programmers and developers. Nowadays, they have a broad portfolio offering also design um, and rapid prototyping and further um, development skills. They have about one million members, so they can get access to members from all around the world with different skills and expertise, different kind of backgrounds. And they are also rewarding the community. Over the time, they spend more than 80 million and rewarding um, their participants. And what happened with the ISS challenge? Was this lucky? So this contest was about running for two weeks and we had about 460 competitors submitting about 2,000 code submissions. And here we have the winners on the slide. The winners were from all over the world, so with the traditional modes, NASA wouldn't have any chance to contact those guys and get their knowledge and get their feedback. And more important, did the solution work? So was the solar output increased? Believe me, NASA is paying a hell of money to Boeing for providing this solution. And here you can see the green lines. And these are the code submissions by the community. And as you can see, the solar power output was increased. And for $20,000 was the price money. Of course, you have to pay top code a little bit to be part of their community, to access their knowledge, but way less than the Boeing solution costs. Siemens was tackling another problem. You know, with more than 400,000 employees set up in business units, they don't know what the other business unit is talking about. They don't know what the other business unit is kind of innovating. And their major problem was if only Siemens knew what Siemens knows. And therefore they set up different crowdsourcing projects throughout the years, internal as well as external, and I just brought one example where the question was how can we generate more sustainable innovative ideas within Siemens and they were approaching their employees to take part of this initiative to contribute idea, to generate idea, to discuss this idea. And as I said, the Siemens is set up in business units and they are not really talking to each other. We thought if this platform is an enabler, so we can have the cross-unit collaboration as well as the cross-hierarchy and communication because I don't know how many times you have the chance to talk to a top manager within your organization. And as you can see here from the social network of this community, the orange line, these are the kind of heterophilous relationship, meaning that there were um, employees, Siemens employees, talking to other employees from different business units and across um, different hierarchical positions. So this platform was a kind of an enabler to um, 
or to improve the collaboration across business units and across different levels. So more and more organizations are kind of working towards this new normal of innovation management. They are trying to combine this open as well as closed system the traditional ways with kind of outsourcing to new talent and to new work. There are also a lot of startups out there who are just starting from the crowdsourcing principles that they don't even think about traditional ways maybe to um, get internal staff to hire them from eight to nine in their own um, um, workspace. And one example was Jay Rogers, the um, co-founder and CEO of Local Motors. And I don't know if you've heard about it. Local Motors was um, um, founded in 2007, so where the crowdsourcing principle were pretty new. And he was totally convinced about crowdsourcing and he set up um, automotive um, 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 industry um, where he says we would like to we would like to de develop the cars um, really from an open source principle, from an open innovation crowdsourcing principle. And by now he has about 19 employees, but his real asset is the community. He's collaborating with more than 50,000 community members. They are working on different projects all around the world. And I brought one example, the Rally Fighter, which was his first car, which was developed based on the crowdsourcing principles. There were more than 25,000 engineers collaborating across 122 countries, and they set up from the first design to the finished product to the finished Rally Fighter within 18 months. I don't know if this is possible in the traditional automotive industry. Um, he is also doing um, or gaining some ex expertise in 3D printing and traditional experience. Um, companies like Airbus are funding and they wanted to learn more about local motors, about the 3, 3D printing, and nowadays there's also. Um, not just about driving, as Airbus is also interested in flying, they are doing a huge challenge on the drone challenge, and right now in Las Vegas the results will be, will be presented. It's not just a US phenomenon, Local Motors is also interested to set up some microfabrics and some initiatives in Europe, and they started um, half a year ago in Berlin with the Urban Mobility Challenge, where they think about new mobility concepts within their cities and they also think about establishing one of their first um, microfabrics um, in Berlin as well. So as I told you, a lot of crowdsourcing examples, um, it's not just that you think about it, the users are putting their ideas in a kind of a submission for um, Dropbox, it's also about not just idea generation, it's also about the voting, the validating of the ideas. And this is also from a research perspective how we evaluate crowdfunding. Normally, the hippo, the highest paced person opinion in the room is taking decision, which idea is great, which idea we should follow, which idea we should um, further work on. But with crowd voting, it's about the crowd who is evaluating, who is testing, who is giving the first feedback. And this is the way how we see crowdfunding as an attitude to the hippo-driven decision-making process. And this is also really important to include an external crowd, not just your internal staff, if it comes to an idea selection um, process. But all these principles, all this crowdsourcing, isn't fun doing when you don't have any crowd to show up. You need a lot of participants, otherwise, the platforms wouldn't work. And recall, if you're doing a contest, or if you do these huge challenges, most of the time, only there's one winner, winner, and the rest is losing. So we thought there must be some other incentives why people are showing up on these platforms. And we did some research, and of course, there's some extrinsic uh, motivation from cash, job market stickers, but most of the people like to be part of the community. They have some pro-social incentives, they have some intrinsic motivation, they say it's fun, it's enjoyment, I like to meet other people in those communities. And we identified different user roles there. 
And if you think about applying crowdsourcing or innovation, you need to address those user roles in these communities and also need to think about um, how you can um, get their motivation to participate. And I would like to um, conclude with some examples because only success stories I've shown so far, but there are also some um, so stories when the crowds don't work. Moleskine once called the designers, the freelancers, to come up with some new logos about their new books. And only the first one will be awarded. And also a nice side effect, all the IP rights will go to Moleskine. The crowd didn't like it and they um, had a lot of discussion on their Facebook fan page. Another fun story is the um, Prill contest done by Henkel. They wanted to come up with a new sign for your um, liquid um, wash up. And there was one guy, Peter Boy, who said, I don't like the, the designs they have on their toolkit. I will use the pen and do my own design. And he came up with a really fun one. Um, Prill smells like chicken. The community really liked it. The community voted for it. And in their terms and conditions, they mentioned so the design which was voted by the community will be produced. So imagine what were the communities doing, the other guys, they come up with pretty silly designs. <laughs> Suddenly they changed the terms and the conditions and the crowd was really disappointed so it ended up in a really um, social media disaster. So no luck with the crowd. So, you have to think about the incentives. You need to have also the right government structures in terms of the terms and conditions to set up right. The problem framing has to be right and the right task. Otherwise, you fail with the crowd. Thank you so much for your attention.